Excellent. Well, thank you, Natasha. It's a pleasure to be with you all today to review these uh, SCCT expert consensus guidelines for coronary CTA in the setting of acute chest pain. Um, my name is Chris Marullis. I, uh, I served as the writing committee chair for this uh, expert consensus panel. Uh, I also serve as the chief operating officer for Innovation Health Services, which is a national digital health practice based in Virginia. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, let's see. So the, uh, the 2022 expert consensus guidelines for coronary CTA in the ED was just recently published in, in JCCT. Hopefully you've um, you know, I had a chance to uh, take a look at this. If not, I encourage you to, to visit JCCT and, and download a copy. Um, we had an excellent panel of, of expert cardiac imagers that were represented by both uh, radiology and cardiology, um, as well as uh, Leslie Shaw, expert uh, cardiovascular data scientist and uh, epidemiologist. Um, this was really uh, an updated iteration of guidelines that we published back in 2014. Um, which was not long after the trial data from Romicat 2 and Akron PA and CT STAT were released. And, uh, and so, you know, a lot has happened since then. And we thought it was uh, a good opportunity to sort of hit refresh with what we thought were best practices for the performance of coronary CTA in the ED setting. So, um, we really created this document to serve as an operational framework, um, not only for imagers, but also for ED physicians and administrators who are looking to, to build these ED programs at their institutions throughout the country. And, you know, we really try to challenge ourselves by answering three questions, three fundamental questions. You know, why do we do coronary CTA in the ED? You know, when or in whom is it most appropriate? And then, you know, on the operational side, how should we be doing it? Um, so just to start with some context, I'm sure this is, you know, familiar to all of us here on, uh, on this webinar today. Um, everyone understands the economic and health burden of chest pain. Um, this is a very common presenting symptom in emergency departments. It's actually the second most common, um, accounted for about 9 million visits annually. And it's quite expensive. Uh, the, uh, the price tag for acute chest pain is about $13 billion each year. Um, and, uh, you know, while acute coronary syndrome is, you know, the, the most feared diagnosis for emergency physicians, there's really, you know, a number of, of life-threatening potential etiologies for acute chest pain. And so emergency physicians are tasked with this, this, this challenge of identifying patients very efficiently and accurately who have life-threatening you know, etiology for their chest pain so that they can implement treatment very quickly. And uh, inefficient diagnostic pathways in the ED you know, have contributed to overcrowding uh, and that has become a serious problem that has uh, plagued hospitals and can be associated with adverse health outcomes. And under the you know, traditional acute chest pain pathway, um, that uh, many of us are, are familiar, you know, patients arrive at the ED, they undergo this, this initial triage with uh, H&P, 12 lead ECG, troponins, and then they're often placed into this observation status for serial testing, which can last several hours and, you know, sometimes is, is you know, involves uh, overnight boarding for, for observation. And, you know, once, acute coronary syndrome has been excluded, you know, they often undergo further testing, stress testing, to look for evidence of, of myocardial ischemia. And even after stress testing, it's often unclear what the etiology for their chest pain is. So this often leads to even further testing with, you know, BQ scanning or CT angiography of the aorta. And then hopefully, you know, after all of that, um, you know, a final diagnosis can be rendered and uh, the patient can be either discharged or admitted for further management. Um, but needless to say, the entire workup can, can take a long time, you know, 24, sometimes even up to 48 hours if the patient comes in on a Friday, you know, um, and uh, it requires, you know, a very large burden of time and resources. And so um, the primary goal of this pathway, you know, has really been to exclude acute coronary syndrome. Uh, and there has been you know, sort of a de-emphasis on 
you know, ruling in the precise etiology for uh, the patient's chest pain. So not uncommon for patients to be discharged from the ED who present with chest pain and not have a diagnosis. Um, essentially, they've just had ACS ruled out. Now, with the introduction of high sensitivity troponins uh, over the last decade, we've been able to streamline this pathway to some extent by eliminating an extended observation period for some patients, but not for all patients. So because of the added sensitivity for you know, detecting myocardial injury um, with the, the high sensitivity troponin assays, a large number of patients um, now have like these borderline elevated troponins, like between the limit of detection and the 99th percentile. And so, um, you know, what do you do with those patients? The specificity of uh, the high sensitivity assay for ACS is still quite low. And so this often still leads to additional downstream testing. And in many cases, no clear diagnosis at the time of, uh, of discharge. So we now have uh, another opportunity to add specificity and sensitivity uh, to the workup of these patients with acute chest pain through this path pathway that's been dubbed CT first. And so CT first is really used to describe you know, the pathway where we implement coronary CTA as a frontline test for acute chest pain triage um, and, and can even further streamline this diagnostic workup. So patients arrive and after baseline EKG and labs, um, those who are appropriate candidates who have this low to intermediate risk um, can undergo early coronary CTA and that eliminates the need for a lot of this downstream testing and uh, can substantially decrease time to diagnosis um, and time to discharge by several hours. And uh, it's, it's important to note that, you know, we have good data now that coronary CTA can be complementary to high sensitivity troponins uh, by adding that additional layer of uh, sensitivity and specificity for ACS, particularly when troponin levels are in that borderline, you know, marginally elevated range. So our, our evidence base for CT first, um, you know, has, has highlighted a number of advantages, um, and uh, I think these have become more clear and the signal, you know, more prominent over the last uh, you know, several years since the first iteration of our guidelines. Um, for one, you know, this pathway can help decompress busy emergency departments and lead to a faster time to discharge. Uh, it's actually, you know, we now have data that it's associated with improved outcomes. So, you know, a decrease in downstream, you know, myocardial infarctions, long-term health outcomes appear to uh, be improved when we implement this pathway. Um, it's associated with lower healthcare costs by improving operational efficiency. And, you know, with CT, we have an opportunity to identify and exclude other life-threatening ideologies for chest pain beyond you know, acute coronary syndrome. So this table here summarizes um, a few of the larger randomized controlled trial data that we have for coronary CT in the ED. Um, and you, know, you, could, you could see some consistent observations that, uh, uh, from these trials, reduction in hospital admissions, um, a, a decrease in you know, length of stay, and lower costs compared to the standard or traditional uh, care pathway. And just recently, as I'm sure everyone uh, on this webinar is aware, you know, the ACC and American Heart Association published the, uh, the much anticipated 2021 uh, update to the chest pain guidelines uh, and their recommendations for acute chest pain triage uh, align very closely with the recommendations that we put forth on our expert consensus panel. And uh, I'll highlight those uh, momentarily. Um, of note though, um, in the 2021 ACC guidelines, they give a very strong endorsement for coronary CTA as a frontline test for acute chest pain triage, uh, assuming the patients have no known coronary disease. It's actually a class 1A indication, uh, and uh, uh, which they deemed appropriate for patients with intermediate pretest risk. Uh, for acute coronary syndrome. And these recommendations also harmonize with the, uh, the 2020 chest pain guidelines uh, that were published by the American Society of Cardiology. So uh, next question, you know, in whom is the pathway most appropriate? Um, you know, 
This is a really important question because, you know, we want to be selecting the right patients for this diagnostic pathway. It's not a pathway that we recommend for everyone. Um, in general, it's most appropriate for patients who have a low to intermediate pretest risk for acute coronary syndrome, normal or non-ischemic ECG, and normal or borderline elevated troponins at baseline. So I think in general, if you can check these three boxes for your patient, chances are he or she is an appropriate candidate for CT first, uh, with, with some exceptions that we'll, we'll discuss here. Um, and really, the position of our, our writing group, as well as the ACC, um, is that you know, appropriate selection for coronary CT in the ED is really best guided by um, having a framework or an institutional algorithm for acute chest pain. Um, and that algorithm always starts with an initial triage. And uh, the three most important elements of this initial triage are having that 12 VDCG, making sure we're catching those patients with uh, you know, ischemic changes, stemmings, rounding them quickly to the cath lab, uh, cardiac troponins to identify you know, myocardial necrosis and injury, um, and uh, as well as some sort of clinical decision pathway or risk stratification tool um, that we can use for patients who are not you know, uh, having active stemmings. So the heart score is, uh, is one of such tools that's used most commonly uh, in the U.S. And, you know, this is actually a, a very helpful tool to stratify patients into low, intermediate, and high-risk groups. And uh, it's based on history, uh, ECG changes, age, uh, the presence of cardiovascular risk factors, and it incorporates, uh, you know, those baseline troponin measurements. The HART score has been, you know, very uh, well-validated um, you know, it, it's, you know, uh, patients are given a score between zero and 10. It's very simple to calculate their score. Um, and really, you know, any score less than three is considered low risk, you know, score between four and six is intermediate. And then anything, you know, seven or greater is considered high risk. So based on the results of that risk stratification and the initial triage, you know, our writing group, you know, thought um, you know, it's it's most useful to categorize patients into um, you know one of five different levels of chest pain, and so you know creating this institutional algorithm or pathway, you know, that's five tier can be very helpful. So your level one patients are going to be your patients who are clearly having a STEMI and belong in the cath lab. Level two would be patients in whom the leading diagnosis is a non-ST elevated ACS or your non-STEMI patients. Level three, you know, um, high risk for ACS by risk stratification, but no objective evidence of uh, acute coronary syndrome. Level four, you're going to be your low to intermediate pretest risk patients. So these are going to be the ones who, you know, we really want to select for CT first. And then level five are very low risk patients who, you know, probably don't need much in the way of diagnostic testing in the ED. So within the context of this, you know, five level chest pain algorithm, we'll kind of walk through um, our recommendations for each level, you know, beginning, you know, with patients who have no known coronary disease. Uh, and so for each chest pain level, our committee you know, provided consensus recommendations for coronary CTA, but also coronary CTA with um, FFRCT or CT perfusion as an add-on test, um, as well as non-contrast CT calcium scoring as a standalone test. And I'll, I'll just preface this by saying, you know, in no scenario did we recommend, um, you know, coronary uh, calcium scoring as a standalone test for acute chest pain triage. I know that there has been some, um, you know, a recent meta-analysis that has sort of called this into question, but I think the consensus of our committee was that, you know, there's an inappropriately high uh, identification of, uh, of patients who have calcium scores of zero, but still have obstructive coronary disease. Um, so we don't feel it's an appropriate standalone test. For the level one patients who are coming in with active STEMI, there's really no role for CT imaging. Uh, and that's indicated by this, this red color here. So these patients need to be going to the cath lab with a door to balloon time less than 90 minutes. Level two chest pain indicates patients with 
the leading diagnosis of a non-STEMI or non-ST elevation ACS. So this includes patients with ischemic changes on EKG, um, without ST elevation, obviously, um, as well as some elevation in their cardiac biomarkers. Generally, there's very little role for CT uh, with you know, the level two chest pain patients. Um, although on rare occasion, you know, CT and geography may be indicated uh, to determine if an invasive strategy is appropriate. And that, you know, we would be considering patients who are at very high risk for a, a procedural complication, high bleeding risk, that sort of thing, but very limited role. For level three chest pain, this indicates patients who are, uh, again, at high risk for ACS based on that clinical decision tool, like the heart score, but who do not have objective evidence of ischemia. So normal or non-ischemic ECG and normal or equivocal uh, cardiac troponins. For these patients, coronary CTA may be appropriate uh, with or without FFRCT and CT perfusion, um, but as an alternative to frontline functional imaging or, uh, or even invasive cath, which may be the, uh, you know, the most appropriate strategy for some of these patients. So um, the institution really should have sufficient experience with coronary CTA and be capable of performing high quality imaging. You know, if level three chest pain patients are being selected for the CT first pathway, um, generally the burden of atherosclerosis is greater in this population, uh, and that can often make these cases more challenging to, uh, to interpret. Um, level four chest pain is um, patients who are low to intermediate risk by the heart score or other CDP. And for these, you know, the, these are really our ideal patients for CT first. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, coronary CTA is most appropriate. It's been most extensively validated in this population of patients. And uh, the coronary CT angiogram can be paired with FFR CT or CT perfusion if an intermediate stenosis is identified on the angiogram. And then finally, we have our level five patients who are at very low risk for ACS and are really you know, unlikely to benefit from additional testing. Um, however, there are some circumstances, uh, and it was a consensus of our writing group that you know, coronary CTA may be considered in some of these patients to confidently exclude uh, CAD and provide additional risk gratification. You know, and in consideration would be some of those frequent flyers who come in, you know, uh, on a regular basis or with high frequency to the emergency department with, with you know, anginal-like symptoms um, and are still considered low risk by risk gratification, but in whom you really want to confidently exclude in a coronary disease once and for all. So for patients with no known, um, uh, or I'm sorry, with known coronary disease who are post revascularization, there is a role for coronary CTA as a frontline strategy, but it's far more limited. So with patients who have uh, underwent prior PCI, um, coronary CTA could be considered, but we would only really want to consider these patients if they had a stent within a proximal coronary segment and uh, you know, the diameter greater than or equal to three millimeters and, uh, with normal or non-ischemic ECG and normal or equivocal uh, cardiac troponins. Um, you know, for patients with prior cabbage, again, you know, normal or non-ischemic ECG and normal or equivocal cardiac troponins. Uh, in both of these scenarios, um, FFRCT has not been sufficiently validated. So currently, you know, we're considering this an inappropriate add-on strategy. We only have a very limited amount of validation data for CT perfusion. Uh, in, in these populations of patients who have underwent uh, prior revascularization. So it should really only be considered uh, at, at centers that have local expertise uh, with the CT perfusion. Um, our committee also wanted to emphasize the importance of shared decision-making between the provider and the patient prior to CT imaging. Um, alternative diagnostic strategies should always be discussed including the option for no further testing, um, observation, and, uh, and functional testing. Um, we also wanted to emphasize the importance of uh, outpatient follow-up and the need you know, to develop a pipeline you know, at each institution 
for patients to be seen in the outpatient uh, setting following their discharge from the emergency department, uh, particularly if, if coronary plaque is identified on the angiogram. And that's really essential to maximize the long-term health benefits of the CT first pathway, ensuring that these patients who have subclinical disease um, are appropriately started on you know, medical therapy, statins and aspirin, um, you know, to prevent those long-term um, adverse cardiovascular events. Um, in our document, you know, we also uh, compare and contrast, you know, conventional coronary CTA with the triple rule out CTA um, and uh, try to provide a framework for when, you know, triple rule out CTA uh, should be uh, even considered. Um, this has gained in popularity, uh, as you know, over the, the recent years. Um, some institutions have more experience than others. It's really a modification of the coronary CTA protocol that extends the craniocaudal field of view, as well as uh, generally extends the contrast bolus, you know, for a higher volume of total IV contrast um, to a pacify both the pulmonary arteries as well as the aorta and the coronary arteries. And uh, because of this, you know, it, it can be a very nice strategy to exclude um, pulmonary embolism, acute aortic syndrome, aortic dissection. And you know acute coronary syndrome, um, which are three you know life-threatening sources of chest pain. But there are some drawbacks. Um, technically, this protocol can be more challenging, particularly if uh, you're at a center that has an older CT scanner, the older general you know 64 slice scanners. Um, it can be associated with much higher radiation. Again, depending upon the scanner that's, that's being utilized. Um, it requires a, a larger IV contrast load, you know, and we also tend to find more incidental, um, uh, you know, uh, non-cardiac findings that lead to further testing. And so for this reason, you know, based on the evidence that's available, you know, our committee, you know, really only endorses its use in select scenarios. So what are those? Um, this, uh, this is actually, you know, uh, from our, uh, our publication, you know, and so really patients who have low to intermediate um, risk chest pain for ACS, you know, the decision bifurcates into CTA or triple rule out CTA. If you're at a site that can do high quality triple rule outs, um, you should only be selecting them if they also have intermediate clinical suspicion for pulmonary embolism or intermediate clinical suspicion for acute aortic syndrome. So what does that mean? Well, if, if there's, you know, positive D-dimer and a history of DVT, history of malignancy and prolonged immobility, um, or if they're you know, greater than 65 years of age and have tachycardia. Um, risk factors you know, that put them at the intermediate risk for acute aortic syndrome, these are gonna be the patients who have known connective tissue disease such as Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos, bicuspid aortopathy, um, if they have symptoms of the you know, abrupt onset of you know, uh, ripping, stabbing, or, or you know, tearing chest pain, um, or physical exam findings of a blood pressure deficit. You know, that, those are the patients who should be selected for, for triple rule out. Um, in general, this is a protocol that's discouraged unless you, know, you really have reasonable clinical suspicion for both acute coronary syndrome and either pulmonary embolism or acute aortic syndrome. Uh, regarding reporting for the coronary CTAs in the ED, our committee recommends following the CADRAS lexicon. Um, this is really crucial for ensuring that uh, results are communicated consistently and clearly between providers uh, and uh, are followed with you know, clear, actionable management recommendations. Um, so just recently, version 2.0 of CADRADS was published by uh, Ricardo Curry and his committee. Um, and, uh, you know, with CADRADS 2.0, uh, we introduced some additional modifiers and descriptors for plaque burden. So the, the CADRADS assessment categories, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 4A, 4B, and 5, remain the same. Um, they're, they're based on the degree of, of maximal coronary stenosis on the CT angiogram. Um, and, you know, with each assessment category, there are specific management considerations or recommendations um, that are included. And that's really meant to provide guidance to the ED providers to facilitate that rapid disposition. 
there's new modifiers now for um, with, with CAD Revs 2.0. For example, modifier I uh, indicates the presence or uh, absence of ischemia. So if, if there was stress testing or if uh, FFRCT followed CT and geography, uh, that modifier I would indicate whether or not the ischemia was positive or negative. Um, if high risk plaque is identified on the angiogram now, this is denoted by the modifier HRP in lieu of uh, that designation V that was part of the original CAD res lexicon. So just changing the, you know, the, the name from V to HRP. And then we continue to use the modifier you know, S for the presence of a coronary stent, G for the presence of a bypass graft and N for a non-diagnostic uh, exam or, if, or specific coronary segments are non-diagnostic. And this figure really kind of summarizes our, um, our recommended management algorithm based on the results of the CT scan and using that uh, CADRADS lexicon. So patients with normal coronary arteries um, or those with minimal stenosis, so CADRADS zero and CADRADS one can be safely discharged from the emergency department. If CADRADS one, if, if there is some plaque, it's minimal, um, then outpatient follow-up is, is recommended. If mild stenosis is detected um, without the presence of high-risk plaque, so CADRADS two without the high-risk plaque, then, you know, again, discharge without patient follow-up is generally reasonable. Um, however, if high-risk plaque is present and there's mild stenosis, consideration should be made for uh, further testing, some, some type of provocative uh, testing, ischemia testing. FFRCT is uh, uh, something else to consider. With moderate stenosis, CADRADS3, uh, these patients warrant further testing, you know, whether it be FFRCT, stress testing, CT perfusion, um, and then even consideration for invasive angiography in some scenarios. Uh, if the ischemia testing is negative, then a lot of those patients can be safely discharged without patient follow-up. CADRADS4, uh, these are patients with a severe stenosis, and generally we recommend these patients undergo invasive cath. Um, however, if the stenosis is less than 90%, we do have some data, um, and, uh, and actually, you know, the 2021 ACC guidelines, you know, recommend consideration for uh, FFRCT um, to adjudicate hemodynamic significance of those stenoses. So again, um, you know, limited utility for FFRCT in that range of stenosis between 70 and 90. So building off all of that, what are some of the strategies for, for really building and, and sustaining a high quality ED program? Um, first, it's really important to have multidisciplinary uh, cooperation. This is something that uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we emphasize in the document. Um, it's important to have stakeholders from cardiology, radiology, emergency medicine, and your hospital administration working together to reach agreement on policies and procedures, make sure everyone's on the same page, and make sure that best practices are being followed. We also um, recommend implementing a very simplified acute chest pain algorithm, um, such as that five-tiered chest pain algorithm that, that I presented today that's in, in our manuscript. Um, this ensures that triage is efficient. It doesn't require a large cognitive burden on busy ED providers, and, uh, it, and it ensures that you know, appropriate patients are being triaged to coronary CTA. You're primarily selecting that level four chest pain with some exceptions for level three and level one. Uh, education and training cannot be overemphasized. Um, this, this really applies you know, to cardiac imagers, um, all of whom should be uh, at least level two trained or, or the equivalent of level two for, for radiologists, um, but as well as you know, CT technologists and nursing staff. We have found that uh, monthly or quarterly stakeholder meetings can be really effective in identifying training gaps at specific institutions and really kind of help make sure that all staff are, are involved and engaged and, and they're comfortable with uh, their roles and responsibilities. Um, emphasizing quality improvement, you know, also extremely important. So 
This includes calf correlation for the, for the patients who underwent CT and have significant stenosis, um, as well as a periodic review of image quality and radiation exposure to ensure that you know, those are uh, both within acceptable ranges. We recommend striving for a, a non-diagnostic CT rate of less than 5%. So if, if the rate uh, of, of a non-diagnostic exam is much higher than that, you know, your site should be investigating root causes. Often it's due to suboptimal patient pre uh, preparation, um, not beta blocking them, you know, as, as, you know, to the extent that they should be. Um, and then, you know, um, offering the pathway deep into the night is, is very important as well. The majority of patients who, who come into the ED with low to intermediate risk chest pain present between the hours of, of 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. And, uh, and, and offering evening coverage for your service line is, is very important. Um, if you don't, those patients who come in during the evening hours and, uh, and qualify for coronary CTA either have to be routed through the traditional pathway or be boarded, you know, at least until the next morning uh, before they can be scanned. And so, you know, obviously that's not ideal. We're trying to improve efficiency. So if your site doesn't have enough local readers, Remote services are available um, that can support your local program by extending the hours of, uh, of service deeper into the night. So with that, um, I really appreciate uh, everyone joining today. Um, it was really a pleasure to be part of this, this expert consensus uh, committee. I'd like to especially thank uh, Ricardo Curry and Frank Rabicki, uh, who were really instrumental in sort of formulating our, our recommendations. Um, we hope that it serves as a useful framework for implementing high quality ED programs throughout the country so both hospitals and patients can, can benefit from the improved efficiency. And uh, I'm putting my email up here. Feel free if you have questions, if you're looking to build a program um, and you need some direction, feel free to, to reach out anytime. So thank you very much.